Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 127 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike, and that is Gavin. And Gavin, where are you going to be spending your holidays? Uh, well, uh, I'm going to be heading up to New York to see my family, just like we did uh, last year. Fortunately uh, for me, because I'm the one that does the driving between myself and, and Liz, um, there's mm-hmm. not going to be a giant snowstorm this year like there was last year. Uh, yeah, that was... Uh... That was rough last year. Yeah, we got uh, about four feet of snow just over like the weekend of Christmas. So like over 48 hours, we had about four feet of snow in my parents' yard. Um, and Liz loved it because she's ha- she's not had a white Christmas in a very long time. She, uh, her mom's family's from Michigan. Living in California, I bet. Yeah. Um, but yeah, her mom is from Michigan. So she would, uh, when she was a kid, you know, go and spend Christmas up there. Um, but it had been a long time since they'd done that. Uh, so yeah. So if the, after the initial sort of freak out of like, what, what happens when the power goes out? Do we have enough food? Like what happens when we can't go anywhere? Um, and it's funny cause, uh, Liz and my mom actually ended up getting COVID that weekend anyway, or I guess they got it the weekend before. Um, and then my mom called me as we were four hours into our five hour uh, drive with this giant storm coming through. And mom was like, Hey, I tested positive. And we were like, well, shoot, what do we do? Um, <laughs> and it was also relatively late. So we couldn't just turn around, you know? Um, right. So we got to my parents' house and we both took a COVID test and we figured, well, if one of us is positive, we might as well both be positive. Um, and Liz tested positive. So we just stayed, you know, the whole weekend, uh, with with my parents, which we would have done anyway, but we didn't get to see like my sister or my nieces and stuff. Um, but yeah, we couldn't go anywhere anyway because of the snow, so it really didn't uh, affect our Christmas at all. <laughs> um, which is, I guess, convenient. Yeah, because yeah. we're all gonna get it at some point, so or yeah. have already gotten it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so this year there's. Uh, forecast to be no snow at all. It's supposed to be like 50 degrees on Christmas Day. So Liz is a little bummed because uh, she enjoys <laughs> uh, having, you know, a white Christmas. But uh, right. Yeah. So that's, that's what we're doing. And then for New Year's, my parents are actually coming down here uh, to deliver uh, one of their Christmas presents and also just to help us with uh, a couple of things around the house. Like I'm as much as I think that I'm a relatively handy person. My dad is much better at that kind of stuff. Um, right. So he's going to show me, you know, how to put in like, uh, like an outlet somewhere or just help me with, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, that, you know, YouTube is only so helpful. It's, it's very helpful, but, uh, you know, <laughs> only so helpful for that kind of stuff. Right. So. But yeah. What, helpful, what about but you? Only so helpful. Yeah. Me, fortunately, I live on the exact same street as my parents do. Oh, I didn't know we've that. We've always had Christmas. Oh, yeah. We've always had Christmas at, uh, at my parents' house growing up. So yeah. I can just walk on down the street and I can hang out with uh, mostly the Italian side of the family. <laughs> and then whenever whenever I'm ready, I get to activate the Irish part of my family and just leave. And just leave. And not tell yeah. anybody. Exactly. It is fantastic for anybody here that does not use the Irish goodbye in your daily life. It's, it's I mean, so I don't good. Know what you're doing. It's so good. All of my friends, all my friends from grad school were very Midwestern. Um, so like I had one friend who was from New Jersey, but the rest were from like Minnesota, Kansas, um, you know, places like that who were just very nice and very polite. And then there's just me, the New Yorker, and then the New Jersey. And we would just be like, all right, see you guys next week. Bye. And then we'd just leave. Meanwhile, Mm -hmm. The, the Minnesotans would still be there 20, 30 minutes after being like, all right, I should probably get going. And they'd still just be standing in the doorway, coat on, boots on, uh, still just talking 20 minutes after they were supposed to leave. Uh, and I'm like, I hate that. Uh, I'm just going to go. Everything about it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it is absolutely the, like, all right, we got to say goodbye to everybody 9,000 times. It's not for me. So yeah. it's uh, not me being rude. Well, it is me being rude a little bit, but a little, a little bit, but um, it is what it is. I'm okay you know? with that. Yeah, exactly. Um, oh yeah. Also, we haven't said this yet. Fia is not with us today. Um, she is oh, yeah. traveling for the holidays. She is. Uh, her and her boyfriend are driving from Florida to uh, spend it with his family in Louisiana. Um, so she's she's traveling. She's having a good time. 
Um, so all the best to Fia. Uh, but it's uh, harder when you're traveling across multiple states, whereas I just have to move, you know, one state and Mike just has to walk. So, um, yep. <laughs> yeah, Sophia will be back with us next for next episode. Um, but in the meantime, I guess I'll do some of the housekeeping for today. Please do, because um, I have no idea what I'd, what I'd even say. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So don't forget to rate the show on whatever platform you listen to us on. Uh, and make sure to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, etc. to give us feedback on the show and suggest any future topics you'd like to hear on the podcast. Uh, if you'd like to be a guest on the show, uh, make sure to fill out uh, the guest form down uh, below in the show notes. And uh, as for what we're talking about next episode, I don't really know. I'm trying to line up a guest episode. Um, so we'll see if that pans out. If not, I will come up with something else. Noted. Cool beans. So, um, Mike told me that uh, he was coming up, or having trouble coming up with uh, a Today in History, because around Christmas time, the world just kind of slows down. Uh, so what, what do you got for us, Mike? Well, I'm cheating, um, because one of the coolest things in American history happened on December 26th. So I'm okay. just making the executive decision that we're sure. going with December 26th. Uh, in 1776, uh, uh, George Washington uh, led uh, U.S. troops to defeat the Hessians in the Battle of Trenton. That's where that famous painting of Washington crossing the Delaware yep. comes from. Uh, the painting itself is not particularly accurate, but uh, right, most of yeah. the details of the battle are. Um, you know, The Hessians were surprised on Christmas. I think the rumor of them being too drunk to fight is, I believe, just that, a, uh, a rumor, but... Yeah, I think uh, it's just still, more that they didn't expect it because it was Christmas time. And which what, is still just plenty good enough for me yeah. as, a, uh, as a cool thing that happened. What heathens would do war on on this holiday? Americans, that's who. That's right. Damn right. Uh, but cool, that, that's a cool one. I knew it was around this time of year, but I did, definitely didn't know the actual day. Yeah, December 26th. That's uh, I'd always a fun thing to go over with my 7th graders when I'm teaching them that. So, yeah. yeah, so that's today in history. All right, Gavin, what uh, what are we learning about today? Yeah, so today we are talking about herbivores and what it takes to eat plants, because uh, surprisingly, it is really hard uh, to, to eat plants full-time, um, which might come as kind of a surprise to people, because uh, all the, the herbivores, the plant-eating uh, animals in the environment are always kind of, A, generally the less interesting ones, <laughs> and B sometimes it's kind of seen as like the background, even when you learn about it in sort of elementary school science, you know, right. It's just like they eat the plants and then the carnivores who are the interesting ones eat the herbivores. Uh, and it makes for good action shots of them hunting their prey and stuff. Whereas, um, you know, a gazelle eating grass is not particularly action. Um, right. Especially when you're a kid, it's just, you know, Eating a steak is, you know, more exciting than eating salad. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so herbivores, like I said, as you learn, a lot of this is going to be like, you know, second, third grade science, you know, ecosystem sort of level stuff. Um, yeah, herbivores are sort of the foundation of at least terrestrial ecosystems. Marine ecosystems get a little funky when it comes to herbivory, quote unquote, because in a lot of marine environments, there are technically not herbs to vor. Um, so <laughs> herbivory in those situations is a little tricky. Uh, but yeah, there's lots of different official, you know, definitions of an herbivore, but it more or less is exactly what you think. It's an animal that gets the vast majority of its calories from plants or algae. Um, there are no animals that get 100% of their calories this way, as we sort of mentioned here and there on the podcast before. Um, you know, for example, if a cow is just out in a field eating grass, they're just naturally going to eat some bugs and stuff on the grass as well. That's just sort of going to happen by accident. Um, or sometimes they'll go out of their way to eat uh, very small animals. For example, if you look on YouTube, you can very easily find... Uh, you know, clips of a deer or a horse or a cow eating like a baby chicken whole, just like snapping it right up. Um, they, they do that on purpose, uh, because A, it's just really easy. You know, it, it, what's it gonna mm -hmm. do? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, yeah. And, uh, you know, protein is protein, you know, 
uh, herbivores need protein you know, just as much as something that eats meat does. And plants they still got to get those gains. Exactly. So plants generally uh, have much less protein, you know, ounce, per, you know, for ounce than you know meat does, or or just a, a whole animal does. Uh, on top of things like calcium, which especially um, female mammals or female reptiles really need the extra calcium uh, for producing milk in the case of mammals or producing eggs in the case of uh, reptiles. So uh, everything is an herbivore until occasionally it's not. Um, mm -hmm. So that's why it's, you know, just an animal that gets the majority, the vast majority of its calories from plants. It Instead seems of, like a lot of those like yeah. non-plant calories are almost a mistake. Like that's a lot like, of them, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's see, and like I said, think back to like first grade science. All life on Earth gets its energy from the sun. With an asterisk, there's like deep sea vent stuff going on that does chemicals from the Earth's uh, deep inside the Earth. But by and large, life on Earth gets its energy from the sun. The plants take in the sun's energy to produce sugar. That's photosynthesis. Uh, then the herbivores eat the plants. Then the carnivores eat the herbivores. Um, mm -hmm. again, again, more complicated, particularly in the oceans, a bit more complicated. But uh, when we take a look at how herbivory evolved toward the end of the episode, we'll get more in-depth on that kind of stuff. But Perfect. because because herbivores are sort of the bottom of the food chain, more or less, um, it can be somewhat natural assumption that they are more simple. And if you take that step, you know, that logic a bit further, uh, it can sort of seem that herbivory is sort of the default setting for mammals. Because it's, it's the more direct way to get that energy from the sun. You know, each time, if you think of like a food pyramid, um, not the like nutrition one, but like an ecosystem pyramid, each time you mm -hmm. go up a level, you only get t about 10% of the energy from the level below you. So uh, I've seen that before. Yeah. Like why why is that? Why like why is it a pretty consistent 10% across the board? Like it, that it seems varies. like one of those things that should Yeah. It varies it tremendously. Very wildly? Okay. Yeah. So that's more um, that's, of a rule of thumb than an actual rule. Right. Um it also depends a lot on like for example reptiles are just much more efficient at converting calories eaten into actual body mass because they mm -hmm. don't have this pesky habit of producing all of the heat uh, that they need mm -hmm. to run their bodies, whereas mammals and birds are wildly inefficient um, because we burn so much of our calories just to keep our body temperature up. Um, right. So, again, it, it varies, and then it's also even weirder when you get into things like insects and things like that that are also, by and large, ectothermic and don't make their own heat. Um, but their their um, metabolisms work just fundamentally differently than vertebrate, you know, metabolisms do. Um, but, yeah, so that is uh, another sort of inherent thing that I didn't really see this anywhere, but this is just something that I thought about in my own sort of musings as I was, you know, doing some background research for this episode, is that's also kind of how it went for human evolution, where to think of things like oh. uh, other apes. As we, we, you know, we've talked about human evolution uh, pretty recently uh, on, on the show. All of our ape ancestors, and even our, you know, currently still living ape relatives, like chimps and gorillas, they by and large eat, you know, almost all uh, plants particularly gorillas, uh, chimps and bonobos tend to do a little bit of hunting. Um, so they're more omnivorous, but still get the majority of their calories from plants. Uh, so, but over time, humans have developed to become omnivorous. And that's why uh, we're actually able to eat both comfortably and as a significant part of our diet. Uh, so that's just sort of something that I kind of thought of in my head is that yeah, it seems like, you know, um, the default is herbivory because that sort of was our default uh, before we, you know, became humans. However, that's definitely not the case in the broader animal kingdom. And if you had to take a gander, Mike, at why herbivory is generally harder 
than eating meat. Why would you think that is? Why? Say that one more time. So, uh, just like, what? why would you think that eating plants is generally harder than eating meat? Like a harder of a lifestyle to make a living out of. Okay, so... So, the answer here is I don't know. Right. I'm yeah. going to make something up. Sure. We're going we're gonna to have fun here. I'm going to make this up. I'm going to assume that there is just, like, something chemically different. Like, taking, you know, plants in leafy greens and converting them into, like, you know, protein and muscle and things in the body. And if that's already been done for you by some other animal, then, mm. like, just that chemical process doesn't need to take place versus if you're eating, you know, you know, all plants, it is there is just more more of a chemical process that needs to take place before your body can actually use, you know, what you've eaten as fuel. That's all I got. I don't have a clue. No, I mean that's, you know, pretty much spot on. So <laughs> the the <laughs> biggest thing if I got that right. <laughs> the biggest thing is that the animal body already has the tools it needs to break down animal tissues because your body does mm -hmm. that all the time anyway. Right. Your own body is constantly breaking down your cells and replacing them as they get older. That's, you know, how your body naturally prevents cancer from happening because you are, whether you know it or not, you are constantly getting cancer inside right. your body. But your immune system is typically pretty good at finding that, breaking that cell down, and then reusing all of those proteins and things. Um, so your body already naturally has the enzymes and, and other proteins that are used to break down animal tissue by default. Uh, that's just part of being a living animal. Whereas right. because plants use different sort of building blocks, we don't inherently have the enzymes that match up with those plant building blocks to break those down. So it's. I mean, it makes sense, I guess. Just like you know, the actual chemistry I assume is like vastly more complicated. But see, it it really isn't. Um, what, like on on a molecular level, yeah, sure. Um, but like I remember being even in college and uh, doing sort of exercises with enzymes, where it's just like a block with a certain shape. Because that's that's all enzymes are. It's just a protein that is a certain shape that fits with another thing. And then, mm -hmm. you know, the enzyme is really only good for a very small range of proteins or other materials to get broken down. And something fits in the slot of the enzyme, and the enzyme just pulls it apart and does its job and moves on to the next one. Um, so chemically, yeah, there are different, you know, bonds being, chemical bonds being broken and stuff like that. But um, from, from a layperson's perspective, it really is just as simple as, you know, it fits in this block. And gets broken up, and that's kind of it. Whereas the plant stuff doesn't fit in the block and can't be broken up. Uh, and you can even sort of see this in if you if you look at some of the most simple animals, uh, the, those being things like corals, jellies, uh, sea anemones, stuff like that. They're all carnivorous. Uh, corals, you know, that might surprise some people. Because you always think of corals as doing photosynthesis, but it's not actually the animal that does photosynthesis. Um, the actual coral animal looks like a sea anemone, just really, really tiny. And <laughs> so they are constantly grabbing stuff out of the water, um, like little, like like fish poop, or just like fish like skin cells that they also shed, just kind of in the water, stuff like that. They're constantly grabbing those out of the water um, to eat. And so the, the coral animal itself, uh, you know, they are micro carnivores. And uh, right. so if you look at just the most simple, most basic animals, they are all carnivorous. That is sort of the default for all animals. Um, let's see. And it's, it's, again, getting more complicated in the water because there's just animal material floating around literally everywhere. Um, that's just kind of microscopic. And it's not all animal material per se. Uh, things like protists or, or protozoans that 
uh, have animal-like cells, but are not animals, just like uh, amoebas and stuff like that. They can pluck out of the water as well. Anything that doesn't have like a cell wall like a plant, um, I'm sort of <laughs> counting okay. as uh, animal, you know, material. Right. Um, and animal cells also, if you look at just, just like, you know, probably by this point, middle to high school biology, if you remember seeing an animal cell next to a plant cell, the animal cell is just kind of like a blob. Just kind of like a rough, roughly sphere shaped, just a generic animal cell, um, without too much structure to it. There is, but it's not nearly as strong as a plant cell, which mostly you've probably seen as like this rectangle that's like very neatly shaped, because it has mm -hmm. that pretty tough cell wall around it, made up mostly of a material called cellulose, and that's really the thing that makes it hard to be an herbivore is cellulose, because there are very few animals at all that have the natural ability to break down cellulose. There are a couple. Uh, to my knowledge, no vertebrates have the ability to break down cellulose by, their se by themselves at all. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Uh, there's a couple things like um, different insects. We'll, we'll talk about that a bit more later down, uh, so I won't spoil it too much yet. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, the reason why plants have this is because plants don't really have, like, a skeleton. So they need something to give themselves structure. If you think of, like, a blade of grass, it's not just, like, laying on the ground like a wet noodle or something. So this cellulose and uh, another compound in the cell wall called lignin, um, they give the plant cells structure. So plants generally are held up sort of, like, on a cellular basis, not with, like, a skeleton and uh, on the inside, like a vertebrate, or even on the outside, necessarily like a like an insect or something. So they're held up on like a cell by cell basis, which is actually really cool. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. So again, it's these two compounds, mostly cellulose, but also lignin, that make it hard. Uh, however, obviously, we still have animals that are herbivores. So what are, what are some of the ways that they get around? Uh, you know this. Uh, problem, really. Because if you can't get through the cell wall, then you can't get to the, the actually digestible stuff that's inside the cell. Um, so let's go through some... I assume some... you're going to tell me something about enzymes? Yes, sort of. Okay. Uh, less less science than that. Uh, mm -hmm. So, um, the most famous group of animals for doing this uh, are a group of animals called the ruminants, which include... Uh, some very familiar animals. These would be your goats, your sheep, uh, cows, deer, giraffes. Um, these are the one, these are the kind that you'll hear have multiple stomachs. If you've ever heard okay. like a cow, a cow has like four or five stomachs. If you've heard that before, right. that's really not quite true. It is all just one stomach. It's sort of just like in different chambers, like your heart sort of is. So you wouldn't say okay. you have four hearts. You would just say your heart has four chambers. Similar thing. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, the first chamber is called the rumen, and that's where ruminants get their name. Uh, I think it's actually like Greek or Latin. Like to ruminate on something means to chew on something. I think it's more of a philosophical thing in the Greek or, or Latin that it's meaning where it means to like think about something for a long time, but literally it translates to chewing on something like, uh, but I think they meant it more as like chewing on an idea or something like that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so they basically eat their food, they chew it up really good. And then it goes into their rumen, uh, which for ferments, the food and breaks it down into more usable molecules. And it's this fermentation is what allows, you know, this plant material to actually be digested. Um, they don't do this themselves though. Instead, they have an enormous variety of gut microbes that do this for them. Something that we haven't really talked about much on the show at all, because it doesn't pertain all that much to paleontology but the whole universe of gut microbiology is wild. Um, particularly in the last probably four or five years, we've started to learn much, much more about like our own gut microbiome and then how 
that differs from all these other animals. In cows and stuff, we've known this for quite a while because of how important culturally and like economically and stuff they are to the world. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, we, we could do a whole episode about, you know, gut flora and fauna. Uh, but that's not really going to be this episode. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah. So they have these bacteria uh, and there's a huge variety of bacteria that can break down cellulose. That's how, like when a tree dies in the forest, stuff breaks it down, not just fungus, but, uh, also lots of bacteria. Um, And in this chamber of the stomach, the rumen, there's lots of those bacteria, and they break it up. But uh, something that uh, cows in particular are very famous for doing, but all ruminants do it, is they spit back up their food after it has been fermenting for a little bit and chew on it more. And that's, uh, if you ever heard of a cow chewing their cud, that's what Mm -hmm. that is. They're, They're chewing up their barf that has been fermenting in the first chamber of their stomach for a while. That's a hell of a mental picture right there. Yep. Um, and so this, you know, they go sort of back and forth between the rumen and their mouth a handful of times. Basically, uh, until the between the fermentation chemically breaking stuff down and then the chewing physically breaking stuff down, um, there's like a basically a gate between the rumen and the next chamber of their stomach that is by particle size. So it's like when stuff is like a like a sieve basically. So it's like when the particles get small enough, then they can move on to the next chamber of the stomach, uh, and be, you know, digested and absorbed, uh, like normal from there. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so that is by far the most efficient way that animals have sort of figured out. Um, at least besides some of the ones that just have, can do it by themselves that can break down cellulose on their own without the bacteria. This whole process of ruminating is much more efficient than uh, any other ways. But we'll talk about a couple of the other ways. Uh, But as a little side note, this whole fermentation process is what causes cows to be a particular problem regarding climate change. Because this kind of fermentation that they do creates methane as a waste product, and they belch that out. So they just burp up methane constantly, which is not good for global warming. Uh, and is that something that actually makes like a significant difference? Yes. Re- okay, with like, given how many cows, cows there, there are on the planet, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, there are billions of cows on this planet, um, and even if each of them all is only producing just a little methane, that's still a, a very noticeable amount of methane. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, if you could take away something from this episode of the podcast, eat just even a little less beef. Um, and that actually does make, you know, a, a semi substantial difference, uh, in like your carbon footprint. Anywho, uh, some other strategies, uh, that animals have come up with that are, you know, helpful for, uh, processing plants is, uh, what horses do. And, they sort of, instead of doing it at the front of their stomach, like cows do, they ferment, uh, the, the mostly grass is what, you know, horses eat instead of leaves and stuff. Uh, they do it sort of at the back of their stomach or at the very start of, uh, their large intestine mostly. Uh, Mm -hmm. if you've ever heard the term, um, they're often referred to as foregut, uh, fermenters, the, the things that do it at the rumen at the front of the gut versus hind gut. Uh, fermenters, things like horses, and then also things like uh, beavers and porcupines, uh, which actually eat a pretty substantial amount of tree bark. Uh, They do this as well toward the back end of their intestines. Um, Rabbits do this as well, but they also do a a different thing. Um, Rabbits will eat mostly hay or grass, uh, and then they'll poop it out, and then they'll eat their poop to run it through the wash a second time. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um. And that's something that, yeah, if you have, like, a pet rabbit, it's actually, you kind of have to keep their poop there with them, uh, or they won't get enough nutrients. Uh, So you can't just have, like, your, you know, rabbit. I think most people, like, litter box train their rabbits when they're kept as pets. Um, But, yeah, it's, you usually have to somehow keep some of their poop in there with them, or it's harder for them 
uh, to get all of the nutrients they need. You still can do it, but it's keeping rabbits is kind of tricky in that way. Uh, birds do it completely differently. Uh, they will sometimes swallow stones. They'll just swallow little pebbles, uh, and they have this special part of their esophagus called the crop, or sometimes called the gizzard as well. Mm -hmm. um, and especially the ones that eat like seeds or some of the tougher plant material, they'll have these rocks that just stay in their gizzard, and as they just sort of move around, uh, the rocks will rub together and sort of crush up the seeds or or other you know plant material that they eat, and that's how they break it up because birds famously don't have teeth to chew on stuff. Um, so that is what the, the turkey gizzard that, you know, you take out of the turkey if you're a normal person uh, at Thanksgiving. Uh, in the past, uh, we won't talk about too much about dinosaurs in this episode, but it is very notable that many, many groups of dinosaurs have been found with rocks inside their chest cavity as well uh, that are very smooth from rubbing up against each other. So it's been very confidently inferred that dinosaurs did this as well. Um, and in particular, uh, a group that is just amazing in everything they do is the sauropod dinosaurs. These are the giant ones with the long necks and the long tails. Uh, Littlefoot from, um, oh, I'm blanking, Land Before Time. <laughs> I was just about to say that was the, uh, the dinosaur one. Yep, right? yep. Um, but yeah, so these guys... One of the hypotheses for how they got so big and what the heck they were doing with such a long neck was that they could just stand in one spot and then just hoover up all of the plant material within reach with that long neck without moving at all. So they could just keep their body where it is, a very energy efficient way to get your food. And then they would take, you know, 20, 30 steps to the next spot and then hoover up all of that, those plants. Um, and uh, there's there's a technical term which I thought was fun for uh, basically the range of that you're able to reach for food without moving is called your feeding envelope. So that was what feeding envelope. Okay. Yep. So if you are like me, I'm, I'm sitting at a desk right now. Your your feeding envelope is just like the distance you can reach with your arms right now. Um, and so the the thought is that sauropods, in order to get to such a gigantic size, um, you know, in, in the you know scale of seventy to eighty tons, um, you know, and and you know pushing a hundred feet long, is that they grew this really long neck to. Uh, you know, expand their feeding envelope in a way that allowed them uh, to get to such size without spending a ton of energy and, and an unreasonable amount of energy. But regardless, as I mentioned earlier, whether they're mammals, birds, dinosaurs, whatever, all vertebrates use this strategy of basically co-opting microbes that do the digesting for us. Um, and this is also the case in humans as well. We have microbes that if you eat broccoli, the microbes, you know, you chew it up and then the microbes break it down for you. Mm -hmm. um, invertebrates, on the other hand, are, as always, a bit more complicated. Uh, most notably, insects. Uh, because most other groups of invertebrates are not terribly herbivorous. Um, there are some, like, snails um, that eat a lot of algae. But insects are the ones that have been studied the most. Um, so some, like lots of caterpillars, don't seem to use microbes at all. They seem to just be able to do it themselves. Uh, and in fact, in some, some of the papers that I read, it seemed like the guts of many caterpillars are antimicrobial and actually kill bacteria. So, interesting. Some use a combination of bacteria and fungi like we vertebrates do. Like, for example, yeast. It's just naturally found in like cow stomachs and stuff. That is one of the uh, thing, the microbes that break down uh, the cellulose for us. Um, some uh, have evolved their own enzymes to break down cellulose, mainly things like termites and grasshoppers and some of their relatives and, and some beetles. So, for example, the caterpillars, they kind of just seem to bulk feed where they just eat and eat and eat 
and just sh through sheer volume and also not needing all that much food, they can just get past the inefficiency by sheer volume. Uh, very much a quantity over quality. Whereas mm -hmm. things like termites, which is particularly why it's so bad for to ha have termites like in, in your you know house or anything, um, they just naturally have the enzymes to be able to break down the cellulose themselves. That's why they're so good at uh, infesting wood in particular. Uh, some beetle larvae that have been experimented on, uh, it seems that they don't necessarily make it themselves, so it's, it's kind of hit or miss whether they make it themselves or they eat fungus that's just on whatever they're eating, and instead of like having the fungus live inside of it, they'll kill the fungus too, but then they'll steal the fungus's enzymes and use them to break down the cell cellulose. They've, they've done experiments where uh, the beetles are in a completely fungus-free environment, like a lab environment, and they cannot break down the cellulose. But if there is some fungus around, they, they can do it half on their own. <laughs> um, which is not, like, unheard of at all. Uh, in animals, a lot, especially a lot of invertebrates do that, um, or just like stealing chemicals from the things that you eat. That's why poison dart frogs are poisonous, because they eat insects that are highly toxic. Um, there are even some snakes that eat toads that are toxic uh, and use that as poison. Um, there's even a, a species of snake that is both poisonous and venomous. So if it bites you, you'll get hurt. And if you bite it, you'll also get hurt because it steals the poison from the toads that it eats. So that is not at all an uncommon thing for animals to sort of steal different chemicals from uh, their, their food that would be noxious that they use to then make themselves kind of noxious. Um, but all this to say, there are very few animals that can break down cell cellulose by themselves. They need these, these bacteria and fungi in their guts to do it for them. Um, and so far, other than the brief mention of things like corals and, and jellyfish and anemones and stuff, uh, it's been a very terrestrial-focused discussion. Um, but that's mostly because plants don't typically live fully in the water, um, especially in the oceans. It's kind of just seagrass um, is, like, the main one. And even then, seagrass can only be found in water depths of, like, not more than, like, 30 or 40 feet. Hmm. So. Uh, herbivory naturally just kind of happens less in the oceans because, as I mentioned earlier, there are not plants to eat. Um, right. However, there is lots of photosynthetic bacteria, which are or, or uh, different uh, floating algaes or things like that. So it's kind of hard. Some of them do have cellulose in their cell walls. Others make sort of their own cell wall out of silica or basically glass, which is just not digestible by basically anything. Um, some make it out of uh, calcium carbonate, the same thing as like uh, clamshell material, which dissolves pretty easily in even a weaker acid. Um, so, as always, in the oceans, things just get more complicated. Um, <laughs> yes. But uh, there are a handful of mostly herbivorous species of fish that do kind of focus on these algae. Uh, they also seem to have a, a symbiotic bacteria relationship going on, um, but don't seem to make very effective use of the cellulose. Their poop is still very full of cellulose, so they clearly don't break it down all that much. Um, but it's also kind of thought that this cellulose in their guts, that they maybe purposefully don't break it down, um, because in uh, fish, it is regulating your ammonia, levels is very important. Um, that is a waste product of uh, respiration, just breathing, or, you know, taking in oxygen. Uh, so ammonia, the, the like same thing you'd use to clean, uh, is, is really easily taken care of when you're on land. You just sort of pee it out. But when you're in the water, well, if you pee it out, you're still surrounded then by your pee and can take that back in. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, the cellulose is somehow thought to sort of bind some of this ammonia and help regulate it within the fish. I saw some stuff about mm -hmm. that, didn't particularly understand it, but thought it was worth mentioning. Um, 
for the most part, though, herbivorous things that live in the oceans are invertebrates, mostly things like sea urchins and stuff. And those also, similar to some of the insects, just seem to be able to break down cellulose on their own. Um, tried to look up anything about the evolution of that. Couldn't really find much because, uh, surprise, enzymes and proteins and things don't, you know, fossilize particularly well. So that is the main problem with why it's hard to eat plants. That's, you know, step number one. But animals seem to have gotten through that relatively well. Um, the next part comes, you know, not necessarily as sort of an accident, because plants, it's not like they use the cellulose, like, as a defense. That's just what they use to build themselves up off the ground. Um, but also, plants generally don't like to be eaten. That's pretty bad for them. <laughs> so... Does, is there any uh, reason why a plant would want to get eaten? Because it also helps them, like... Fruit. Spread spread a seed and reproduce. Like, is that... That's... that's like the, a possible knock-on effect? Yeah, that's the only purpose of fruit, actually. Okay. Uh, uh, is, okay. is to be eaten. And that's why fruit generally uh, don't have this problem. That's why the inside sort of meat of, like, an apple is much easier to, like, chew than, like, a stick of celery or something. <laughs> okay. It's because it's supposed to be eaten. Uh, that's the entire evolutionary purpose of fruit just existing at all. Uh, but otherwise, no. Uh, there's not a whole lot of other reasons a plant would want to be eaten. Um, and so, because of that, they have a variety of defenses about uh, against being eaten, both physical and chemical. Uh We'll start with some of the physical ones. These are things that are probably relatively obvious. Things like uh, thorns, spines, uh, or prickles, which is the technical name of things on roses, because they sort of snap off. Um, mm -hmm. So, fun fact, every rose does not have its thorn. Uh, they are called prickles. Fun fact. Prickles. Yes. Um, things like uh, acacia trees, which are... Um, very well known from like the African savanna, places like that. They have enormous spines, like several inches long, because they need to defend themselves against things like elephants. Um, many plants on their leaves also have these little tiny hairs that are sort of irritating to the skin of vertebrates. Or if, uh, you know, whatever invertebrate is trying to eat them is small enough, it just sort of gets in the way and tangles them up so that they can't eat if they're worried about being stuck. Uh, so many develop some kind of waxes to make their leaves or stems kind of slippery and harder to sort of grab onto to eat. Uh, many species of grasses incorporate silica crystals into their cell walls, which are basically these little tiny shards of glass. Um, they help give them structural, structural support, sort of like the cellulose does, um, but mostly also compression resistance, which helps against herbivory. And it also comes with the handy side effect of wearing down the herbivore teeth significantly over time, because it's literal glass, um, and which causes them to die quicker because they can't chew anymore because they have no more teeth left, and then they starve mm -hmm. to death. Uh, that's why way back in the horses episode, horses have very long, very, very tall teeth to have more of a grinding surface because their food is basically just like eating sand. Uh, which wears down your teeth pretty quickly, as you could imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and also, many plants also will purposefully make one part of their body extra tasty, fruit, uh, so that an herbivore will be more tempted to eat that instead of the more useful parts. So that's just some of the physical stuff. The chemical stuff, though, is where plants get intense. And this is kind of why, as I've mentioned many times, I'm a little bit afraid of plants. I don't like them. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, as you've made clear several times. Yeah. So, the chemical defenses in plants, they, they vary wildly. Um, and they can be as simple as something like capsaicin, which is the chemical in peppers that makes them spicy. Um, these, this uh, whole group of capsaicins... Um, are really only detectable by mammals. Birds don't have a receptor to this. Um, and so most peppers are dispersed by birds, preferentially, which is nice because you want birds to eat your seeds and then fly far away to drop your seeds off somewhere else. 
Uh, birds also, like I mentioned earlier in the episode, don't have teeth. So they don't chew up the seeds and harm them. Whereas if a mammal eats it, they're going to chew it up and destroy the seed. Um, mm-hmm. So this is a very mammal-specific um, chemical defense that makes them not taste good. Um, and humans are just crazy and are like, ooh, I like pain. Uh, and I'm going to continue to eat this thing that the plant is like mm-hmm. screaming at me. Hey, don't eat me. I will hurt you. Um and humans are just like, I, I like it, though. <laughs> um, but yeah, capsaicin is meant to taste bad. But not, no, very importantly, not kill the animal. Because, you know, even there's even a slight chance that, you know, your seed will be passed through the mammal. Killing the mammal doesn't really get you anywhere. So capsaicin mm-hmm. is a deterrent, not lethal, really. Um Many other varieties of plant have something similar to this, where it's just a very bitter taste. Um, most of these bitter chemicals, though, are actually quite harmful or even potentially deadly. So, for example, some plant toxins uh, that have this bitter taste usually interrupt the ATP pathways in cells, which ATP is what your mitochondria make, and that's basically the energy currency for your body. So... If you can't make ATP because of one of these toxins, your body's just going to shut down. Um, some of these toxins are the same shape as certain hormones and will bind to their receptors. For example, things like adrenaline is a hormone. There are plant toxins that bind to adrenaline receptors, and so your body just can't accept adrenaline anymore. <laughs> um, others will bind to DNA. And change its shape, potentially just giving the herbivore cancer. So, here are uh, a couple of the very famous plant toxins that humans have figured out some other way to use. Um, Caffeine is a toxic stimulant that can mess with many parts of the body in large quantities, particularly the heart. Um, As anyone who's been following the Panera lemonade situation probably knows oh good god i can't believe we were able to work that into this yep uh god i it's been so interesting just following that situation but we're not going to talk about it um but yeah caffeine is extraordinarily dangerous in large enough quantities um another natural plant toxin is nicotine which on top of being one of the most addictive substances that we've ever found uh, in high doses, can cause seizures and also heart problems. Then that's aside from uh, all the other bad things that tobacco uh, does to your body. Just the nicotine by itself can just give you seizures uh, in high enough doses. Uh, another completely naturally occurring plant toxin is morphine. And that can cause you to lose control of some of your muscles, particularly your diaphragm muscle, which controls your lungs. So you just stop breathing. That's basically what an opioid overdose is, or at least, you know, part of it. Um, Another one is the whole group of chemicals called cyanides, which stop your mitochondria from working correctly. And then, like I mentioned before, with interrupting the ATP pathways, your body just kind of shuts down. And that's what cyanide does. All of those are completely naturally occurring in plants that they use to keep things from eating them. Hmm. Plants are pretty metal. Uh, yeah. Um, Which, it sort of begs the question why you don't why you don't like them if they can be so metal, but I met, they're just so far afield from what you normally talk about. Oh, I think they're super interesting. I, they're just way more complicated than mammal, or than, well, mammals especially, but uh, than, than animals. Um, mm-hmm. You know, as I've mentioned before, plants sometimes just from like, you know, one generation to the next will just like double their genome. And if that happens in an animal, the animal doesn't survive. But in plants, that's totally fine. That's totally fine. Um, mm-hmm. And that doesn't seem to interrupt their life in any way, and I don't understand that at all. Um, mm-hmm. But, yeah. So, going back to to the, the actual herbivores here, obviously, with th- these are some of the extremes on, on plant defenses. Um, so, many plants have sort of much more watered-down versions of some of these defenses. 
um, in some form or another. And herbivores obviously need some kind of way around these defenses, otherwise they wouldn't be able to eat the plants. Um, and the, the main one, it just sort of starts with picking your target. Uh, most herbivores are somewhat picky in which plants they'll actually eat. So if you don't eat the tobacco plants, the nicotine can't kill you. <laughs> it's pretty, <laughs> pretty simple. Uh, you know, similar to the, the physical defenses as well. If you don't eat the acacia tree leaves, the spines won't stab you, etc. Right. Um, after you pick your target, then you sort of need to f figure out some way to get past its defenses. Uh, this is where sort of the evolution takes place and herbivores adapt to get through some of these defenses. And that's not to say nothing eats acacias. You know, I think giraffes are, are pretty well known for eating acacias. I think they have like a very, uh, this like skin on the roof of their mouth and their tongue is like very thick. So they can just kind of chew their way through the pain. <laughs> um, stuff like that. Um, but some other examples uh, are a very similar thing that I just mentioned with giraffes was with camels. Uh, cactus spines, you know, if, if you're an herbivore living in deserts, you cannot be all that picky about what you eat because you might not find another plant for a day or two and you need food. Right. Um, so camels just have really thick tissue on the inside of their mouths and they just chew through the spines of cactus. Um, many herbivores have chemicals in their stomachs that partially detoxify some of the poisons uh, that the plants use. Uh, some have modified their, you know, regular stomach enzymes or, or potentially the bacteria um, in their stomach have evolved, you know, different enzymes. Because uh, while the animals are evolving as well, the uh, bacteria in the stomach are also evolving. Um, it's a very complex evolutionary relationship between your gut microbe evolution and, you know, the evolution of the actual animal that they live in. It's very interesting. Um but yeah, they can sort of neutralize some of these poisons. Um, some have evolved enzymes to just sort of encapsulate the poison molecules. And so they just sort of put them in a little bubble and they just pass right through the gut un undigested. Um, some do things way simpler and just produce a lot of saliva, <laughs> a lot of spit, just to water down uh, the, the amount of toxins you know, per milliliter that they're actually eating mm -hmm. can be as simple as that. Um, as I mentioned, though, for the most part, it is pretty much just the, the microbes doing a lot of the heavy lifting here. Um, mm -hmm. And there is uh, so much more to say about this whole interesting predator prey relationship between plants and herbivores, because that's really what it is. Um, the same way that, you know, gazelles and cheetahs have been evolving to just be faster and faster to try to outrun each other. Um, very similar evolutionary, you know, arms race between herbivores and the plants that they eat. Um, because to a plant, an herbivore is a predator, not just the thing that the lion eats. Uh, so they also, there's, there's so much interesting to talk about, about this evolutionary relationship that we don't have as much time to get into. Um, but uh, now for the this last sort of segment of the podcast, let's actually talk about some paleontology on this paleontology podcast. Um, so let's sort of start by talking about marine ecosystems in the time before life came onto land. So way, way, way back in the day. Um, at first, there were no true plants in the ocean, just algae, things like kelp so like maybe like macroalgae large very plant-like if you've ever seen kelp but kelp is not a plant um i was gonna ask why they're not plants but maybe that's a story for another time yeah um some technical distinctions mostly it's like a, a phylogenetics thing where it's like they don't um just like evolutionarily they fall outside mm -hmm. of the most recent common ancestor of all the plants i think they're they're very close though understood um or even just things like microalgae on top of these larger algaes like kelp. So just things floating around in the water doing photosynthesis. Naturally, that's part of any marine or even like a lake ecosystem. Uh, doing the similar things of most primary producers where they're taking in the sunlight, doing photosynthesis, doing their thing. Uh, most of them at this time were single-celled, 
typically had less cellulose um, than we see in, you know, like land plants. Because, as I mentioned, the whole reason cellulose really is a thing is to give the, the cells in the plant structure. And if you're in the water, you don't really need structure because the water support, supports you by itself. You don't need, um, you know, that's why, you know, really squishy things can't really live on land because they don't have any way to support themselves. But a jellyfish mm -hmm. is perfectly fine in the water. Um, so there was just naturally less cell cellulose to go around. Um, and that was sort of the case for the very early part of complex ecosystems, mostly in the Cambrian period, give or take 550 million years ago through, um, closer to 500 million years ago. However, once life moves up onto land, things don't sort of change right away. The first, you know, multicellular things to come up onto land was plants. Plants much more like uh, mosses, very simple plants. Uh, they come up onto land in the mid Ordovician period, around 470 million years ago. Um, and within a few tens of millions of years, the first vascular plants evolve. Uh, things like simple ferns or uh, quill warts or another group of modern plants that are uh, pretty quote unquote primitive. But the, the first plants with actual like tubes in them to run, you know, materials from one end of the plant to another. Mosses don't really have that. Um, and by the middle Silurian to the early Devonian, plants were forming very short, uh, forest-like ecosystems, maybe a few inches tall, uh, somewhere in the ballpark of 430 to 400 million years ago. So from the time they come up onto land, nearly 100 million years later, um, we have very tiny, teeny, tiny little forest. <laughs> Um, that's a fun way to put it yeah because they were you know there were different species of plants all at sort of varying different little 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 heights the tallest ones still not being more than a few inches long um but l sort of layered like you would think in a forest mm -hmm. um by around this time same time though you know er early 400s to about 400 million years ago uh arthropods were coming up onto land as well but many were likely still eating each other. Some of the first arthropod or terrestrial arthropod fossils that we see are things like scorpions and spiders, which are almost universally carnivorous. I think there's like a single species of herbivorous spider across, you know, hundreds and hundreds of species. And I don't think there's any non-carnivorous scorpions. I think they're all universally carnivorous. Um, really? Yeah. And so they likely were just coming up onto land. Uh, to escape things, uh, trying to eat them in the water. Um, until some of the, there was one group that is today all universally herbivorous that was around at this time too. And those were things like millipedes. We have some millipedes at the time. So these all started to come up at roughly the same time. Um, so there is the very beginnings of some kind of modern ecosystem dynamic where there's, just kind of a couple of things eating plants at this time, but things still mostly eating other animals. Um, and so plants were basically on land for over 20 million years before things were around to eat them, which is kind of mind boggling to me. Uh, throughout this time after arthropods sort of come up onto land, they continue to diversify for millions of years and were the only herbivores for a very long period of time. Uh, again, pretty much just millipedes. The ancestors of insects were starting to come around at this time as well. Um, and again, just barely starting to dabble into herbivory. Uh, but the first vertebrates to be very adapted to life on land were very salamander-like. So imagine just like a, a vague salamander shape, but, you know, sometimes quite large, you know, six or seven feet long. Mm -hmm. uh, by the end of the Devonian period, somewhere around 380, 370 million years. So this is, uh, give or take 50 million years after what we were just talking about with the first arthropods coming onto land. Uh, and, but at this point, all vertebrates still predatory. 
they were just coming up, eating each other. Because, you know, salamanders as well can, you know, function pretty well on land and in the water. So they just had more opportunity to eat any other animal. Um, and it wasn't until the late Carboniferous period, maybe into the early Permian period, that vertebrates started to dabble into herbivory. So that's around 300 million years ago. Basically, arthropods were the only herbivores for about 70 to 80 million years. Hmm. And that seems like a long time. Like, yeah. I get something always has to be the first, but that seems like a long time for something to be the only one. Yeah. Well, if, again, if you're just sort of getting... You have to get past that initial hurdle where it's like, well, if I can't digest plants at all yet, there's really not a selection pressure to try eating a plant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, I guess that makes sense. So, but once that hurdle was sort of crossed for the first time, um, you know, it, it sort of explodes. Um, this, and if you think about that, selection pressure to become herbivorous is pretty obvious. It's a food source that, by this point, you know, the Carboniferous is famous for having giant rainforests. By this point, we went, you know, as I mentioned, a couple inch tall forests to, by this point, there were trees hundreds of feet tall. There were, you know, full, especially during the, the sort of mid-Carboniferous, full, the entire land was covered by rainforest. So plants were abundant, were doing great. So the selection pressure to become herbivorous was very obvious. No other vertebrates are eating this food source that is covering the literal entire planet. So if nobody else is eating it, that's more food for me. <laughs> yeah, the market inefficiency. Exactly. Um, unfortunately, uh, toward the end of the Carboniferous, that is when Pangaea starts to form. Uh, and as we've talked about, when Pangaea forms, uh, the middle of Pangaea is just so far from the oceans that it becomes basically a giant desert. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, the rainforests of the Carboniferous did not last all that long. Um, but by the start of the Permian, uh, some of the first groups of herbivorous uh, vertebrates were around. And while we'll never truly know the answer, the biggest question around this is how did vertebrates first start getting these bacteria in our guts to allow us to break down cellulose? Um, and we'll never really know because just the nature of fossils is that we very rarely get gut contents of animals that is like the bones or, you know, chewed up plant material of something that was eaten. If that's incredibly rare to begin with, we're definitely never going to get fossilized gut bacteria. <laughs> that just doesn't happen and likely will that never thing. happen given how old this is. Mm -hmm. um, but... As always in paleontology, we do have some generally educated guesses, uh, or hypotheses, as they're known in the biz. Um, there's a couple of different thoughts. The one that seemed the most likely to me is that there was a group, or, or more likely several different groups, you know, because by this point, reptiles had split off to their own thing, mammal uh, ancestors, the synapsids, had split off to, to do their own thing. Um mm -hmm. So, likely several different groups started off insectivorous, eating all the different bugs and stuff that could digest cellulose. And by eating them, we also ate their gut bacteria. And then, over time, the gut bacteria, you know, maybe in just one particular, you know, animal, uh, their gut was more hospitable to those same gut bacteria that were just not, you know, dying after being eaten when the insect was eaten. And they just sort of hung out and uh, basically went from uh, insectivorous to omnivorous eating insects and also um, maybe the leaf that the insect was on as well. And then that sort of slow transition from insectivory to omnivory to full herbivory. That is pretty much the the only super viable seeming uh pathway 
that I could find is that they basically just stole the gut microbes from the bugs. <laughs> and this whole, however it happened, this kicked off basically everything of how modern ecosystems work. Uh, because at this point, we've we've had uh, plants evolving, uh, you know, new ways to get past being eaten by these invertebrates. But now, this kicks off plants evolving to not only get past the invertebrates, but also now the vertebrates. And then the vertebrates re-evolving new ways to get past the new defenses that the plants have, have evolved. And then while all that's happening, you have the carnivores over off on their side. Uh, evolving new ways to eat the herbivores. And that basically kicks off everything that we understand about modern ecosystems can really be traced back to this evolution of herbivory in sort of the early uh, Permian period, uh, you know, almost 300 million years ago. Mm -hmm. And then at, at that point, we're just kind of off to the races. Um there was uh, a class that I took in grad school that was terrestrial paleoecology. And that we... sounds like a real barn burner. I liked it. Uh, it was, it was, I know, I know you liked it. That was <laughs> <never a> question. <laughs> well, that class in particular was kind of interesting because um, we're, we're kind of drifting away from the topic here a little bit, but um, I took that class with um, one of my professors was also a PhD student in our department. And so he took that class while I was TAing for him in one of his other classes. So it, it simultaneously one semester, he was my classmate and also kind of my boss. Um, mm -hmm. It was a little weird, especially when I think that semester, that class only had like four people in it. Uh, but yeah, anyway, we talked a, a little bit about, you know, the Carboniferous and the Devonian periods, but it's like, well, Ecosystems back then were just really bizarre because of how little mm -hmm. herbivorous activity there was. And it's not until the Permian where things start to look even a little bit like they do today. Um, right. And yeah, uh, I guess from this point, see any of our episodes uh, talking about the individual <laughs> periods uh, as we're every, you know, inching ever closer to the modern day. We just had a, our episode about the Paleocene. Uh, epic a couple episodes ago so yeah that's that's kind of all i got do you have any any last burning questions about how to eat a plant should i be a vegetarian and give me a yes or no i don't want any of this middle of the road nonsense so person i can't say yes because i'm not uh <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have tried okay. it and uh, it was actually going quite well and then COVID lockdown happened <laughs> and I was like you know what well, I, could well. I could really use a burger right now uh, <laughs> <laughs> yep. um, I know that feeling yeah and so I, I was for probably close to a year um, <laughs> but so wow how old were you so that was right before COVID yeah okay I mean, I think COVID, we all needed a couple of good burgers. Yep. So, I'm going to say no, even though we all, the answer should be yes. <laughs> but <laughs> If you can pull it off, great. But if not, uh, don't feel too bad about yourself. Right. Just just eat more chicken and, and a little less beef. That's yeah. And on that note, <laughs> and on that note, thank you everybody for listening to episode 127 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. We hope you have a wonderful holiday um, and a nice new year. And we'll see all of you guys in that new year. Until then, take care, everybody. This episode of I Wish You Were Dead was written by Gavin Davidson and hosted by Gavin Davidson, Mike Bryson, and Fenella Campanino. It was sound edited and edited for YouTube by Gavin Davidson. Special thanks to former guests of the pod and to listeners like you.